there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. By the mid-1950s, the Irish influence on criminal activity had dwindled. The Mafia now had the upper hand. By this time, there really wasn't much of what you would call an organized Irish-American unit. There was nothing comparable to the Mafia in terms of the Irish-American gangster in the 1950s. Whatever structure had existed back in the 20s and 30s had long since died out. There remained some powerful Irish criminal gangs in cities like New York and Boston. But aside from that, the Mafia reigned supreme. One of the most valued Irishmen in the Mafia was Frank the Irishman Sheeran. Sheeran operated within the Mafia for over 30 years. Frank Sheeran would have been a classic case of Irish-American gangsters that uh, were tough enough to operate as, as lone wolves within the underworld structure. In 2003, while on his deathbed, Frank Sheeran began to tell his story to his lawyer. He spoke about the work he did for the mob and the Teamsters Union, and his friendship with Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa. He talked about the dispute between Hoffa and the Kennedys, and how he claimed the mob were behind the assassination of JFK, and about being pressurized by the mob into killing his old friend, Jimmy Hoffa when Hoffa himself started causing trouble. I think Sharon's story holds together, and he did, in fact, kill Hoffa, and uh, he did it only because he had no choice. Frank Sheeran was born on October 25, 1920, in Darby, Pennsylvania, a small mining town on the outskirts of Philadelphia. He had left school by the time he was 16, expelled for breaking the principal's jaw. He enlisted in the army in August 1941, and by the end of that year, America was embroiled in World War II. Sharon was in uh, combat during World War II for 411 days, which has to be a record. Uh, the average amount of combat for infantrymen who were in Europe in World War II was 100 days. On his return to Philadelphia at the age of 25, he had seen a world of killing and crime, and found it very hard to settle into normal life. In order to support his family, Frank took a job with the driver's union, the Teamsters. Frank initially went to work as a rank and file union member with the Teamsters and showed that he had a certain talent for uh, physical activity, both as a worker and also in terms of uh, violence related to the underworld. Frank was slowly being drawn into another way of life. He was often away from home, spending a lot of his time with his Italian co-workers in the area of Philadelphia known as Little Italy, where he met Russell Buffalino. Buffalino was a major mob family member in this country. There essentially were, and probably still are, five major Casa Nostra families. And Buffalino, while linked in some ways to the Genovese family, really was outside all of them and looked upon as uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the elder statesman when they had troubles. Buffalino, who was uh, no dumbbell, uh, saw, I think, in Sharon uh, a completely fearless guy, as well as a bright guy. Sharon's friendship with Buffalino drew him closer to the Mafia, and before long, he was working for them full time. But his home life was suffering. He now had three daughters, but he had no interest in his wife and family, and he deserted them. The mob was Sheeran's family now, and they introduced him to one of the most powerful men in America. Russ Buffalino recommended Sheeran to Jimmy Hoffa, the powerful, colorful president of the uh, Teamsters. Hoffa's first words on the phone were, I heard you paint houses. Paint your house in mob language means to kill uh, as a hired killer. And uh, the expression really comes because uh, in theory and maybe in practice, paint splatters, uh, or blood, blood, which is the paint, splatters all over the house. That very night, Sheeran flew to Detroit to work for Jimmy Hoffa. 
Jimmy Hoffa was undoubtedly the best known labor leader in American history. The Teamsters, America's largest, strongest, most strategically placed, most swaggering, most colorful, and most crooked union that the world has ever known. And I don't intend to have the impression left that's been stated publicly that I'm controlled by gangsters. I am not controlled by them. Hoffa, as president of the Teamsters Union, was sort of the overlord of the Teamsters pension fund. And so it became a kind of uh, an underworld uh, banking source in the 50s and 60s. The birth of Las Vegas, for instance, was financed greatly through use of the Teamsters pension fund. The Teamsters Union, under Jimmy Hoffa, was the mob's golden goose, and they used men like Frank Sheeran to keep a tight rein on union affairs. Sheeran could be trusted to be quiet about it. He didn't ask questions. He was a tough, tough guy, and uh, he was extremely loyal. And Hoffa was very much admired by Sheeran. Sheeran said there were only two people in his life whom he really gave total respect to. Russell Buffalino was one, and Jimmy Hoffa was the other. And Sheeran, although he was uh, essentially a soldier in the ranks, so to speak, was a very close soldier, confidant and friend of Jimmy Hoffa's. When Hoffa needed a uh, little personal protection, even though he uh, was loath to admit he was afraid of anything, and I really think he was a very fearless guy. I don't need no bodyguards. Well, Hoffa don't need no bodyguards. He said, I'll be okay as long as I have the Irishman with me, and that was uh, Frank Sheeran. Sheeran was the guy he relied on. Hoffa put his trust in Sheeran as he settled problems for him daily, but there was a big problem on the horizon that Sheeran wouldn't be able to handle, the Kennedys. The Kennedys were preparing to go after the mob, and Frank Sheeran was about to become involved in an event that would change world history forever. The authorities were intensifying their campaign against the mob, and Jimmy Hoffa was public enemy number one. I'm not satisfied when I see men like Jimmy Hoffa in charge of the largest union in the United States, still free. Sheeran learned of the hatred between Hoffa and the Kennedys, a history that dated back to the McClellan Committee hearings. The McClellan Committee was constituted specifically to deal with racketeering in interstate commerce in the United States. And that meant dealing very specifically with the activities of the Teamsters Union. And Bobby Kennedy let it be known that uh, the person that he saw as the main source, if not the sole source of corruption in the Teamsters Union was Jimmy Hoffa. Did you make that statement after these people testified before the committee? I never talked to either one of them. Jimmy Hoffa had a sense of the historical parameters of the underworld, and he knew that Bobby Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, had had a long series of relationships with underworld figures. Joe Kennedy was able to reach back into um, his years of uh, associations with criminal figures and exert the kind of influence that was needed to turn out money and votes in major cities in the United States and set up a series of meetings with underworld figures in New York and in Boston and Chicago to help get his son elected president of the United States. The mob promised him that support on condition that Bobby Kennedy would lessen or withdraw the vendetta he pursued against the Mafia during the 1950s. It was Frank Sheeran who brought the news to Hoffa that the mob were about to make a deal with the Kennedys. When Jimmy Hoffa became privy to the fact that Sam Giancana and other members of the Mafia were going to use their influence to try to help get John Kennedy elected president, he was livid. There was a meeting that took place in Chicago, I believe. Frank Sheeran, by this time, was close to Jimmy Hoffa. You might even say was a bodyguard of Jimmy Hoffa's. He was at this meeting that took place between Sam Giancana and Jimmy Hoffa to discuss what they were going to do about John Kennedy's campaign for president of the United States. Sheeran listened as Giancana said he'd fix the election in Illinois so Kennedy would win. Hoffa tried to talk him out of it. The Kennedys could not be trusted. A 
record number of Americans, upwards of 67 million, go to the polls to elect the 35th president of the United States. Not till the middle of the next day was the victory reclenched by one of the closest margins recorded, a plurality of barely over 300,000. One of the first things John Kennedy does as president is he appoints his brother, Bobby Kennedy, Attorney General of the United States. So this sets off alarm bells all throughout the underworld. He's, he's made Bobby Kennedy his number one law enforcement person. This does not look good. And it doesn't take long at all for the mob's worst fears to be realized. Bobby continued what the Teamsters always called a vendetta against Jimmy Hoffa by setting up uh, a group of, uh, at one time, 21 of the best lawyers, as the expression goes, that money can buy, and given one mandate to devote their full time to, and that is get Hoffa behind bars. The Kennedys were creating great difficulties, difficulties that were too big for Frank Sheeran to handle alone. Among the major mob leaders in this country, Hoffa knew plenty of them, but, uh, one controlled all of South Florida, a fellow named Santos Traficanti, and the other was a fellow from New Orleans named Carlos Marcello, both very close friends of Hoffa's, both uh, hating, for whatever reasons, uh, the Kennedys, and uh, both had said that they would uh, like to help their friend Hoffa out. There was a meeting in New Orleans in which Carlos Marcello made the statement to an associate of his that we're gonna take care of our Kennedy problem. He was referring to Bobby Kennedy, so his associate assumed that he was talking about an assassination of Bobby Kennedy. And he said, you know, you, you can't do that. If you kill Bobby Kennedy, uh, then the President of the United States is gonna come after you. And Carlos Marcello made the now famous statement of, well, if you want to kill a, a dog, a rabid dog, you don't, you don't cut off the tail, you cut off the head. And this was a reference to the fact that the mob was gonna kill not Bobby Kennedy, but John Kennedy. They were gonna go over the head of Bobby Kennedy and kill the president. The wheels were already in motion, and Frank Sheeran would play a part in the fateful events which would change the world forever. At the start of November 1963, a short time before JFK was killed, Frank Sheeran received a call from Jimmy Hoffa. He was to meet Russell Buffalino, as there was another job to be done. He collected a bag, which he was to bring to a private airstrip in Baltimore. The bag contained three rifles. We'll never know specifically who was behind what happened on November 22nd, 1963. But what we do know is various factions of the mob and the Teamsters Union had serious disagreements with the Kennedy administration, disagreements to the point where they felt that their very existence was at stake. And so a series of events were put into play involving Carlos Marcello and Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante and quite possibly augmented by Jimmy Hoffa that uh, lead up to the assassination of John Kennedy. If the mob did orchestrate Kennedy's assassination, their curse followed his brother Bobby too. Without JFK, his power was gone, but before he left office, he vowed to put one man behind bars. Jimmy Hoffa was found guilty of two different things at two different trials in 1964. He did indeed go to jail and was sentenced to serve five to eight years uh, and was released in four years, nine months, and. Uh, and 18 days. And during that entire period, uh, Frank Sheeran, above all, did troubleshooting uh, jobs for uh, Hoffa, getting messages sometimes to uh, Russ Buffalino. Frank Sheeran visited Hoffa regularly in prison, but with Hoffa behind bars, the mob had more control of the unions, which were now under Frank Fitzsimmons' command. Fitzsimmons allowed the mob, after Hoffa went to jail, to get more deeply into the pension fund and all that money which built Las Vegas, Nevada and did many other things. Much more than Hoffa ever did. Hoffa could say no to the mob, always, as well as yes to the mob. And Hoffa broke with the mob and as he tried to come back when he was out of jail, 
to become Teamster president. He reportedly was talking to Justice Department officials in a quid pro quo for being allowed to come back as president. And the word went out, and we're now speaking of 1974 into five, that Hoffa had to be taken care of. Hoffa's return was not welcomed by many, especially Buffalino. Sheeran was now caught in the middle. He was torn between loyalty to his friend and his loyalty to the mob. Russ Buffalino warned Hoffa not to come back as Teamster president because there are too many people who wanted to get rid of him. And uh, Sharon was very much present, although quiet, in those discussions. He was with Hoffa not too long afterwards when Buffalino suggested that he personally talk to Hoffa. And Sharon privately uh, also told Hoffa just before the big day, July 30th, 1975, you can't do it, Jim. You won't live. Jimmy Hoffa's number was up. Buffalino had requested Frank Sheeran would get rid of Hoffa, leaving Sheeran caught between a rock and a hard place. He had no choice. Sheeran realized, and it didn't take long, that if he didn't do this job, uh, he would be killed. Jimmy Hoffa is called to a sit-down with Buffalino and another mafioso by the name of Anthony Provenzano. And Frank Sheeran is going to bring Jimmy Hoffa to this meeting. Sheeran picked Hoffa up from the car park of the Maccus Red Fox restaurant outside Detroit and drove him to a house where the meeting was to take place. They drive to this house. It's a very kind of anonymous uh, middle-class house in a middle-class neighborhood. And Jimmy opens the door and walks into the house and Frank Sheeran is behind him. Frank Sheeran puts his gun to the base of Jimmy Hoffa's head and shoots his friend in the head and kills Jimmy Hoffa. The most, certainly the most uh, convincing case I've ever heard is that Sharon was indeed the guy who killed Jimmy Hoffa. It broke his heart to do it, but he had no no choice. Sheeran claimed Hoffa's body was taken to a crematorium for disposal. No remains have ever been found. It did affect him greatly. It devastated him. He was always a drinker, but he turned to very heavy drinking after that. And uh, got old very, very fast. The murder of Jimmy Hoffa is one of the greatest unsolved crimes in American history. The FBI put 200 agents on the Hoffa case, but no one was ever charged with his murder. The uh, Hoffa investigation involved several key suspects, but the only guy who really knew uh, firsthand would have been uh, the Irishman, Frank Sharon. And the hope was, through the 80s, 90s, that someday somebody would give a deathbed confession. And uh, the Sharon story is a deathbed confession. He did it when he was dying. Uh, he wanted to be right with his maker, as he regularly said. And everything that I know certainly convinces me Sharon did the deed. Frank the Irishman Sharon died three days after confessing to the murder of Jimmy Hoffa. His story shows the extent of the Mafia's power in America throughout the 1960s and 70s. But from the mid-70s on, it would be the Italians coming under attack. The authorities vowed to wipe out the Mafia, and in cities like New York and Boston, the Irish mob were going to help them do it. NBC's Ashley Banfield has more. The FBI today increased the reward being offered for information leading to the capture of fugitive Irish mobster James Whitey Bulger. On the run since 1994, the price on Bulger's head now stands at $2 million. Whitey is wanted for, for 20 years, one man ran the city of Boston. He controlled the cops, the politicians, and the criminals. His name was James Joseph Bulger, but on the streets of Boston, he was simply known as Whitey. 
Well, the Bolger family is kind of a classic Irish-American story. I mean, within that family, you had the two brothers, James Bolger, the criminal, and William Billy Bolger, the politician. Their skills were equal and similar in many ways, but they just applied them to an entirely different uh, avenues of, of uh, advancement. Whitey became a master at his game, which was uh, the underworld. Uh, while his younger brother Billy uh, became all-powerful and a master in, in, in his, and that was the political world. The story of Whitey Bulger is one of family, loyalty and corruption that has its roots in the tight-knit Irish community of South Boston, known as Southie. South Boston was the place where the Irish were, they went there and it sees itself as being a place apart, apart from the city, apart from the country. It's physically an island and mentally, in, in a psychological sense, it's an island too. It, it's particularly clannish. Like thousands of Irish immigrants that sailed across the Atlantic, James Bulger left the west of Ireland in the early 1900s. He made the journey to Boston, where he met and married an Irish girl called Jean McCarthy. In 1929, their first child, James Jr., was born, and the young couple's future looked bright, but their happiness was short-lived. The father, uh, James Bulger Sr., was a uh, just a standard uh, laborer, and uh, he, he lost his arm in, a, uh, in an industrial accident in the uh, 1920s, so uh, the family descended into uh, fairly abject poverty. The first, uh, public housing project in the United States of America was uh, opened in South Boston in 1936. The Bulgers moved into it, and uh, that's where they grew up. Although there were only four years between Jimmy and Billy, it was clear from an early age that they were very different. While Billy excelled in his studies, Jimmy was more interested in what he could learn on the streets. I remember interviewing people that they remember Whitey Oh, as, as a young man, this is before he became what you would consider a criminal, just driving around in, in an in a, uh, open-top convertible. Um, he was, you know, the James Dean, the sort of the rebel and the sort of tough guy. But he also was recalled by people as sort of the guy that would stick up for the, the kid that was getting picked on. So even at that young age, he was sort of building what I would call kind of the Robin Hood reputation as a, as a, as a he might be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. By the time Billy was winning scholarships to college, Whitey had dropped out of school, and in 1948, he enlisted in the military. But trouble had a habit of following him. He went into the Air Force, and uh, he was just a disciplinary problem from day one. I, I got a look at his, uh, his disciplinary records from the Air Force, and uh, he was uh, accused of uh, rape. He was actually thrown in the uh, military brig in uh, Montana. The, he beat the rape charge, and uh, when he was up on the charges, he was told by, uh, by the, the captain, he said, if we find you guilty, you'll get a dishonorable discharge and you won't be able to get a job when you get out of the military. And Whitey just laughed at him and said, the, the kind of work I'm going into, I don't need an honorable or a dishonorable discharge. He was involved with a, a gang of bank robbers that worked in various states. They worked as far west as Indiana. And uh, he was finally uh, captured. In 1955, Whitey was arrested and sentenced to 20 years in prison for his part in bank robberies in four different states. When he entered the Atlanta penitentiary, he was 26 years old and was prepared to do whatever it took to shorten his sentence. It was a very controversial program involving the testing of LSD and testing it on uh, prison inmates in the United States to see the effects. It was something that um, the US government did quite secretly for na what they would consider national security reasons. And you know, when we were doing the research back in the 80s, we found that Bulger had actually volunteered for this project with the expectation that it would reduce his sentence by a certain amount of time. Some of the prisoners tested on ended up insane. Others, like Bulger, stopped sleeping and became very violent. The tests were stopped, but Bulger's behavior was still problematic, and he was shipped off to a new home. 
Alcatraz. With no hope of escape, Whitey developed an interest in reading, and one book in particular captured his imagination. Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince became Whitey Bulger's Bible, and in it, he discovered ways of obtaining power through whatever means necessary. A prince should therefore have no other aim or thought, nor take up any other thing for his study, but war and its organization and disciplines. For that is the only art necessary to one who commands. When James Bulger went off to prison, he was a certain type of criminal. But when he came back in the late 60s, he was a different type of criminal. He was smarter, uh, much more Machiavellian, had uh, reached the conclusion that uh, you wouldn't necessarily gain uh, what you needed through brute force, that it had to be a combination of brute force and also uh, a strategy. And so when he reapplied his uh, newfound intellectual skills to the neighborhood, you begin to see Jimmy Bulger become Whitey Bulger. Bulger might have transformed himself in prison, but the Boston underworld had also changed while he'd been away. There was a gang war in the early 60s in which well over 50, 60 guys were murdered. Had Whitey been on the street, there was a statistical chance that he would have been one of those guys that get killed. A lot of potential rivals were literally taken off the count. So when he got out there, there was more opportunity for a guy like him. He could reestablish himself quickly. Whitey just sort of got back into the rackets. He, he was a, uh, an enforcer or, or a collector, a muscle guy for a guy named Donald Killeen. Uh, the, the Killeen brothers uh, worked out of the lower end in South Boston. They had a bar called the Transit Cafe. They pretty much had control of uh, the rackets in Southie. But the Killeens weren't the only gang operating in Southie. And in his first year back on the streets, Whitey got caught up in a gang war between the Killeens and the Mullins. There was personality conflict between the Mullin gang. We were a loosely organized uh, bunch of thieves, you know, we hijacked trucks, we robbed. Uh, the clean gang, uh, they, were all, they were more of the traditional organized crime. Whitey worked for them, he wasn't the boss or anything, you know, he, we weren't overly impressed with him. He was a sharp guy, you know, stayed in good shape, liked fancy clothes, had an overinflated opinion of himself, we thought at the time, but we weren't impressed with him. In the years to come, Whitey Bulger and Pat Nee would often work together as criminals, but for now, they were enemies in a gang war, which the Mullins were winning. In 1972, the Colleen's boss, Donald Colleen, was murdered at his son's birthday party. Entrepreneurs are simply those who understand that there is little difference between obstacle and opportunity, and are able to turn both to their advantage. Now, Whitey Bulger was never charged with murdering Donnie Colleen, but I remember even hearing this when I was a kid, that, that Whitey Bulger was given credit for that murder, that, that the word on the street was that he killed Donnie Colleen, that he took out a guy that had controlled a lot of the rackets in Southie, and this allowed him to be seen as the heir apparent to Donnie Colleen, which was actually the genius of Whitey Bulger even the mere perception that he took out Donnie Clean and actually took him out in about as ruthless and as callous and as calculated a way uh, that, that scared people and said that this is a bad guy. And if you cross him, he'll shoot you. And if he has to shoot you outside your little kid's birthday party, he'll do that too. With the removal of their boss, the Clean gang was finished. A meeting was called between the city's various criminal factions to try and broker a truce between the Mullins and Whitey Bulger. I arranged uh, a get-together with Whitey through uh, the Winter Hill Gang and the, uh, the Mafia guys. They sponsored him so we couldn't kill him under those circumstances. And how he went this from the Winter Hill Gang, he sponsored us so he couldn't kill us. You know, that's how you do it. You know, there's like a guarantee from uh, a, a higher power, if you want, that there be no treachery involved. Men rise from one ambition to another. First, they seek to secure themselves against attack, 
and then they attack others. Jim Bulger moved aside the last remnants of the Colleen's, formed a, a partnership with Patney and, and the last remnants of the Mullen gang, also forged a partnership with the Winter Hill gang and Howie Winter, and really consolidated spheres of power that by the time the dust settled would put Whitey Bulger on an equal plane with the Mafia faction in Boston. Whitey Bulger was running things in Southie now, and within 10 years, his allies in the Winter Hill Gang and his rivals in the Mafia would be eliminated. And it would all be done for him by the FBI. In the 1970s in Boston, Whitey and Billy Bulger were rising stars. Whitey was running the rackets in Southie and Billy had been elected to the state Senate and was earning a reputation as a ruthless politician. Bill Bulger had a reputation uh, in his world that uh, in some ways uh, matched Whitey's in the underworld. I mean, Bill Bulger was not someone you wanted to cross politically. Uh, there'd be payback politically. He got into politics very early while, when Jimmy was still not a major gangland figure. But, you know, at some point, it was pretty obvious that Jimmy Bulger was never coming back to the right side of the law. And so I then, then Billy Bulger's loyalty, I think, then was, uh, was much more from a brotherly sense. You know, I would imagine any brother that loved a brother would try to protect them. How far he would go to protect him? I don't think Billy Bulger would break the law to protect him. I don't think that Jim Bulger would put him in that position to do that. But uh, again, what wouldn't you do for your brother? I think uh, Billy uh, wanted, uh, wanted Whitey taken care of, and people have testified in Congress, and uh, Billy has said it didn't happen, but Whitey supposedly told, Pete, told his associates in the gang that uh, Billy had ordered Zip Connolly to take care of Whitey. Zip was the nickname of John Connolly, a young FBI agent. John Connolly was born and raised in South Boston, a new Whitey Bulger as a child. They met in a car, Whitey agreed to meet him, and they talked it over. They forged uh, an alliance there, um, where the FBI was looking for information uh, against the Mafia in Boston. And uh, what does Bulger get out of it? Well, I don't know. No one will ever know exactly what was said at that first meeting. Um, but, you know, the bottom line, the thrust of it is, is if we're busy going after the Mafia, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to have a lot of time to be going after you. The FBI put Whitey in contact with another top echelon informant, Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy. Bulger and Flemmy formed a partnership, and with the help of the FBI, they ruled the Boston mob for 20 years. Stevie wasn't one of our guys. Stevie's not from Southie. We never had anything to do with him. We never liked him. Whitey brought him on the scene. And now we know why. They were both informants at the same time for the government. From the start, Whitey Bulger used the FBI to further his own ends, using them to eliminate anyone who stood in his way. The first people that they, he moved against was his own gang, the, the so-called Winter Hill Gang from Somerville, which was uh, about half Irish and half Italian. He manipulated himself in there through, through killing people, through uh, setting people up to go to prison, to uh, setting people up so they have to go on the run. At one point, he had all of us either in prison, fugitives, or dead. And he rose to power. He moved everyone off the board except him and Stevie. Next to go were the Boston Mafia. In 1983, the Angelo brothers, who ran the New England mob, were indicted. It was a major coup for the Boston FBI and for John Connolly. The role Whitey Bulger played in the Boston FBI's efforts to, to go after the New England Mafia has been vastly overstated. And the one writing the script of that was none other than John Connolly himself, because he needed to. He needed to justify the corrupt dealings he had with Whitey Bulger. And, and this was a line he used all the time. We would never have toppled the mafia in New England if not for Whitey Bulger. The way I looked at it is that really you could justify using Bulger as an informer probably up until the early 80s. Basically, they knew at that point from the early 80s on that when they took out the Italians, 
The only one that was going to be left standing, who really had juice in this town, who really could make money off the rackets, whether it's extortion, shaking down bookies, um, you know, loaning money out there through loan sharks, it was Whitey. So at that point, the FBI, in my opinion, was obligated to shake Mr. Bulger's hand and say, you know, we appreciate the relationship, but now, you know, we got to go do our job and, you know, you're next. Because that's the way it works. But like I said, I think John Conley had other, there were other motives involved. And, and I think one of them was John Conley's admiration for Billy Bulger. In 1979, Billy Bulger had been elected as president of the state senate and was now one of the most powerful politicians in Boston. He was hugely popular in Southie's working class neighborhoods. The Bulgers were seen as their protectors. Billy looked out for them in City Hall and Whitey took care of them on the streets. Whitey Bulger is the stuff of legend and in this hard scrabble Irish enclave, Whitey Bulger has a lot of friends. I see him out there, you know, helping out the community, boarding up houses that do drugs and sell drugs. There was this myth, and a lot of his defenders, including his brother, um, would say that, you know, he doesn't touch, he doesn't involve himself in drugs. There was that, like I said, that, that, that sort of, he was a gangster, he was a mobster, but he would never sully himself by getting involved in drugs. I lived in South Boston throughout most of the 80s. There was as much coke, if not more, per capita in this town, in South Boston, than there was in any other part of the city. Directly involved in drugs, he wasn't. What he would do was he would find people that were selling drugs, large quantities of drugs, and make them pay him for the right to sell these drugs. I mean, he extorted them. He wasn't, he, you know, he didn't condone drugs, but he figured drugs was here, so he might as well make money off it. There's several key pieces of the myths involving the myth of Whitey Bulger, one being the Robin Hood, one being he kept drugs out of Southie. I think the most stunning piece of it was that Whitey was the ultimate stand-up guy. That was his reputation that went right to you know his Irish heritage, uh, the Southie neighborhood. They could never catch him because they could never turn anybody in his organization. He kept things very close to the vest, trusted only a, a very uh, inner circle of people like Stephen Flemmy. Uh, Kevin Weeks, who became known as Whitey Surrogate's son. Kevin Weeks started working with Whitey Bulger in the 1970s, and for the next 20 years, he was one of his closest associates. He was dedicated to crime. He was, you know, 95% of his waking hours was dedicated to crime. That's all he thought about, committing crime, getting away with crime, uh, out thinking people. And so while other people were out on the weekends drinking and partying or whatever, or relaxing, he was thinking about crime. And uh, he was an intelligent man, and he stayed on top of everything. Weeks soon realized how Whitey Bulger operated, using blackmail, violence, intimidation, and murder. There was victims that were killed for uh, basically old beefs that uh, were looked to be settled. You know, people that uh, weren't criminals but had one way or another crossed uh, Jim Bulger and Stevie Flemmy. And then there was uh, people that they killed just they didn't like or they didn't trust. Uh, two women were killed, you know, and uh, there was no reason for it other than uh, Stevie Flemmy, uh, his ego, he couldn't let them go. These were uh, girlfriends of his partner in crime, another serial killer, Stevie Flemmy. And uh, one of them was uh, basically uh, Stevie Flemmy's stepdaughter, who he had been having sex with since the age of 14. Well, that was uh, Deborah Hussey. And that was the girl that was involved with Stevie Flemmy's stepdaughter. And Stevie was having relationships, and she was threatening to tell. And she came into the house, and Jim Ball just started strangling her. Basically, you know, she was dead. And then Stevie Fleming says, no, she's still breathing. And he put a rope around her neck and put a stick through it like a garage and started strangling her that way too. There was kind of a competition there, I felt. You know, who's the better killer? Whitey would, Whitey would get sexual release from murder. Literally, he would have to lie down on the, he was, these, these are all things we started seeing by by, by degrees, how sick he really was. No, I don't think he had sexual release from killing. I mean, I was with him when he, you know, he killed five people. I never saw any of that. He enjoyed killing people. 
And uh, again, like I said, it was like him taking a volume. It was more of a stress release than it was anything sexual. During the 1980s, Whitey Bulger's murderous reign spread throughout the city of Boston. And through it all, the FBI protected him from investigation. But people grew suspicious of how Bulger had managed to avoid the authorities. John Connolly retired in 1990. Uh, and they were uh, well on their way to getting, a, getting away with, with a couple of decades of murder and mayhem. And the reason I say that is because the Boston Globe uh, published in 1988, two years earlier, a series about the Bulger brothers. And in that series, it reported for the first time what we called a special relationship between Whitey Bulger and John Connolly and the Boston FBI. The FBI lied to the public, denying the truth of the story. They denied, flat out denied, that Whitey had any, any special relationship, anything to do with the FBI. So what's a journalist to do at that point? At John Connolly's retirement dinner, the guest speaker was none other than Billy Bulger. Uh, I met Billy as a, just a young kid in the neighborhood. He was then, and he is now a man of integrity and intellect and honor. And I'm proud to call him my friend. But with Connolly now retiring, he'd no longer be there to protect Billy's brother. You had a changing of the guard, so to speak. And with that arrived a couple of young uh, prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office. They looked around. They saw Whitey. He's the biggest game in town. It has been for years. Why aren't we doing Whitey? And then once they got in, they themselves went through that same experience that so many of us had. They kept going, holy shit, as they peeled away one layer of the onion after another. The net was finally closing in on Whitey Bulger, but he had one ace left up his sleeve, John Connolly. Well, it was two days before Christmas, and uh, John Connolly came down, and he was looking for uh, Jim Bulger or Stevie Fleming, neither one of them around. And that's when he told me about the indictments coming down, and they were going to try to pick them up over the holidays and arrest them all at the same time. So when I left there, I uh, beeped Jim Bulger, met him, told him, and he left. Whitey Bulger went on the run on December 23, 1994, something he had been planning for a long time. He had started back in the early 80s, establishing an ID and, you know, and different offshore accounts and everything. You know, he was, uh, you know, looking ahead the whole time. The feds have discovered safe deposit boxes in, uh, in Italy, the UK, Dublin, uh, Canada, Florida. I mean, and th those are the ones they found. I mean, how, who knows how many more are out there. He also had an Irish passport, um, which would have allowed him quick access through any number of the EU countries. But um, he knew that the day of reckoning was eventually coming. One by one, the authorities took down everyone involved in Whitey Bulger's web of crime and corruption. Steve Flemmy was sentenced to life in prison. Kevin Weeks was arrested, and to avoid life imprisonment, he cut a deal with the authorities that saw him released after five years. Connolly is now serving a 40-year prison term at a state prison in Chipley, Florida. Billy Bulger still lives in Southie. Whitey Bulger, who was on the run for more than 16 years, was captured in California in 2011. He is currently serving two consecutive life sentences for his crimes. Whitey's the last of the last. There's no question about that. In fact, in many ways, the saga of the Irish-American gangster by the 1970s and 80s in Southie with Whitey Bulger and in Hell's Kitchen with the Westies is almost the reverse of what it was when it first began back in the latter decades of the 19th century. Back then, you could make the argument that the underworld, the mob, was a means to an end. It was an avenue of advancement that was utilized by the Irish and other ethnic groups that arrived in the United States. And that advancement took place for the Irish over the course of the 20th century. And so the Irish as a people, as a group, really didn't need organized crime anymore. It no longer served that function. 